Hello, and my name is Kevin Hatton. I'm an Associate Professor of Anesthesiology and Chief of Anesthesiology Critical Care Medicine at the University of Kentucky. Today I'm going to be talking about the management of respiratory failure. Presentation goals are to briefly review the basic respiratory physiology, including hypoxemic respiratory failure, hypercarbic respiratory failure, and discuss methods to improve hypoxemia and hypercarbia, including supplemental O2 therapy, peep and recruitment maneuvers, and to introduce mechanical ventilation. Now, before we start, I want to talk about the, the idea that the management of respiratory failure can be covered in a single lecture. Clearly, obviously, that's not the case. And so, in many ways, this is an overview lecture and lectures from your intensive care unit, PACU rotations, and other areas will we'll specifically talk about many of these same ideas. Now, in terms of an overview, remember that the main functions of the respiratory system are to facilitate oxygen translocation from the atmospheric gas to liquid blood and to facilitate carbon dioxide translocation from liquid blood to atmospheric gas. So that when these fail, the respiratory system will failure leads to inadequate systemic oxygenation and carbon dioxide toxicity. First, we'll talk about hypoxemic respiratory failure. And as is sort of obvious from the name, hypoxemic respiratory failure results in inadequate systemic oxygenation, whether that be inadequate uh, pulse oximetry or inadequate oxygen, uh, partial pressure of oxygen uh, on blood gas. In general, it occurs for two main, main reasons. The first is inadequate alveolar oxygen tension uh, caused by either a hypoxic gas mixture or reduced barometric pressure or an increased shunt fraction caused by either uh, increased pulmonary shunt or increased cardiac shunt, typically a, a so-called right-to-left shunt. Therapies for hypoxemia include oxygen supplementation, which is a supportive therapy, but it is the first-line therapy or the first step in the treatment for hypoxemic respiratory failure, and it's generally used until a more definitive therapy can be implemented. Definitive therapies are usually designed to reduce total shunk fraction, including um, resolution or improvement in atelectasis, treatment of pneumonia, reductions in pulmonary edema, and drainage of pulmonary effusions. Hypercarbic respiratory failure results in systemic respiratory acidosis and it results in multiple organ system depression. Like hypoxemic respiratory failure, it occurs for two major reasons. The first is inadequate respiratory rate, and the second is inadequate alveolar ventilation. That could be, cause, that could be caused by a reduced tidal volume or an increased dead space volume. Hypercarbic respiratory failure is easily detected on either blood gas or in tidal CO2 because there's an elevation in the PaCO2, typically above 40, and or a decreased pH, typically less than 7.3. Other signs include tachypnea or a discoordinated disco respiratory rate, as well as shallow breathing and the use of accessory and abdominal muscles to aid ventilation. Treatments for hypercarbia are, are usually uh, temporarily relieved with, uh, sorry, hypercarbia is usually temporarily relieved with increased FiO2 and usually require the use of either invasive or non-invasive mechanical ventilator support. Overall, these are supportive therapies, again, that are designed to prevent respiratory system co failure complications until the treatment um, or the resolution of the hypercarbia can be, uh, can be definitively treated with uh, either mechanisms to treat COPD exacerbations, asthma exacerbations, or narcotic overdoses, and the major three causes. A more detailed look at a of the management of hypoxemia starts with, as we've already said, supplemental oxygen. And remember that, as I've said several times, increased oxygen administration or supplemental oxygen can almost always temporarily improve hypoxemia but it's almost never an appropriate long-term treatment. And remember, there are four types of supplemental oxygen. The first is a nasal cannula, either regular flow or high flow, a face tent, a venturi mask, and then a face mask with valve and reservoir. Each of them can deliver different amounts of FiO2, and each of them have specific purposes as described in this uh, table. 
I'm going to take a second to talk specifically about Venturi masks because I see them used uh, incorrectly by uh, healthcare providers uh, on occasion. And please remember that a Venturi mask is designed to be used um, at a constant oxygen flow rate. And the way that a Venturi mask is that when oxygen fl uh, flows through the little adapter, and six different color adapters are shown there, but when oxygen flows through that adapter, um, air is entrained so that a very specific FiO2 is delivered to the face mask. Each of the different colored attachments are associated with a diff the delivery of a different uh, FiO2, provided that you use the correct fresh gas flow rate. And the Venturi principle, if you remember, suggests that as um, gas flows from an area with a low diameter to an area with a high diameter, the pressure itself changes. And so as air moves from the, from the small uh, uh, clear gas tubing into the adapter, the pressure changes, and that pressure change itself causes in, uh, 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 entrainment of, of air into the, into the Venturi adapter. The non-rebreathing the, the non mask is, is frequently used at the University of Kentucky, and it, it has various names, but the non-rebreathing mask itself is able to provide very high FiO2 to most patients, sometimes as high as 90%, but it does require three major things to be a non-rebreathing mask. The first is a very tight fitting mask. The second is a one-way expiratory valve to reduce rebreathing of the exhaled carbon dioxide, and then a reservoir uh, for use during inspiration to, in, to ensure that an adequate amount of, of oxygen is available to the, uh, to the patient during inspiration. High flow nasal cannula also deserves a special mention because increasing in recent data suggests that high flow nasal cannula is very effective in reversing various types of hypoxemic respiratory failure. In fact, new data suggests that in many types of hypoxemic respiratory failure, this can be more effective than even non-invasive ventilation in uh, improving oxygenation as as well as preventing the need for uh, invasive mechanical ventilation. High flow nasal cannula is provided with special equipment such that oxygen can be delivered via that nasal cannula at a very high flow rate. It does require an oxygen blender and a humidifier and usually special nasal cannula as well. The increased flow rate raises the mean airway pressure and thereby improves oxygenation in a manner simpler, similar to CPAP that we'll talk about shortly. Uh, positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP. Hey, not that kind of PEEP. I'm kidding. So physiologic PEEP, uh, the physiologic basis for PEEP is that there's an application of a resistor or resistance to flow during um, exhalation. This resistance um, can either be intrinsic so that it creates auto peep or extrinsic or therapeutic peep. Overall, the physiologic basis of this resistance to flow is that it prevents derecruitment of unstable alveoli as well as it increases the mean airway pressure to recruit marginal or highly recruitable alveoli. This application of peep improves the mean airway pressure, which improves oxygenation particularly in patients with shunt due to atelectasis. This occurs most, or the easiest way to think about this is the, 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 the west lung zones that you may have been taught during physiology courses, such that there are three zones, zone one, zone two, and zone three. In zone one, the, the pulmonary alveolar pressure is greater than the pulmonary arterial pressure, which is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure. And this is known as dead space. In zone two, the pulmonary arterial pressure is greater than the pulmonary alveolar pressure, which is greater than the pulmonary venous pressure. And this is known as uh, a normal area or well oxygenated or um, well matched areas. In zone three, the pulmonary arterial pressures are greater than the pulmonary venous, which is greater than the pulmonary alveolar pressures. And this is known as shunt. So in cases of hypoxemia, there is more zone three than there should be, or than there is normally. But um, in terms of PEEP, the idea is to increase the alveolar pressure or the mean airway pressure when the two are very similar, such that the alveolar pressure then becomes 
greater than the venous pressure and so zone 3 lung gets converted uh, into zone 2 or shunt gets converted into normal or well-matched lung. Now PEEP is good in that it improves oxygenation but there are also some complications associated with its use. The most important is there's a real risk of cardiovascular impairment. And this occurs because the mean airway pressure is translated throughout the entire thoracic cavity. So that as you increase that pr the mean airway pressure, the, the intrathoracic pressure increases. Admittedly, this is somewhat dependent on lung and chest wall compliance, so that if there's less compliance in the lung and the chest wall, that same increases in mean airway pressure may not actually uh, be translated well. But for most patients, increases in mean airway pressure do translate to some increase in thoracic, uh, intrathoracic pressure. This increase in the mean intrathoracic pressure results in decreased venous flow to the right atrium, which decreases RV preload, subsequently decreasing cardiac output and ultimately blood pressure. A second complication that occurs from PEEP is an increase in dead space. This occurs because some zone 2 lung gets converted to zone 1 when the pulmonary alveolar pressure is increased above the pulmonary arterial pressure um, by the increase in mean airway pressure. In general, the magnitude of this complication is small and can usually be in reversed with a very small increase in minute ventilation typically through either in a small increase in minute ventilation or more commonly a small increase in respiratory rate. Now, who are good candidates for PEEP? These are typically patients with hypoxemia despite increased FiO2, patients with diffuse acute pulmonary disease such as ARDS, poorly compliant patients with a poorly compliant respiratory system, patients with adequate or normal cardiac reserve, and those who have normal or increased intravascular volume, those patients who have a tendency for atelectasis, and patients with acute pulmonary edema and or increased LV afterload. So who are bad PEEP candidates? And bad PEEP candidates are patients with unilateral or highly localized lung disease, such as a right lower lobe pneumonia or a single lobe pneumonia or single lobe lung process, emphysematous lungs, patients with chronic lung or chest wall diseases that may not actually improve oh, with acute application of, of, of changes in mean airway pressure, patients with cardiovascular compromise, and patients with hypovolemia, particularly patients who are, uh, who are in hemorrhagic shock or, or very near to hemorrhagic shock. Now, when it comes to setting the PEEP, it, it's somewhat hard to know the right answer because to date, no large randomized control trial has demonstrated a role for any specific marker to determine the, quote, best PEEP in patients with ARDS. Even less is known about what the right amount of PEEP is for other types of patients with hypoxemia. We do know that possible or potential titration, titration targets may include titrating PEEP to the best oxygenation, titrating PEEP to the least amount of shunt or venous admixture, maybe titrating PEEP to the best lung compliance, or using a concept of the lower inflection point, which is, which is characterized on a pressure volume graph. We're going to switch gears slightly to rec recruitment maneuvers now, which is another way to improve hypoxemia. So remember that hypoxemia may occur due to collapsed or atelectatic lung units. And remember that atelectatic lung units are lung units that are perfused, but not well ventilated. So strategies to improve oxygenation include to reduce the number of atelectatic lung units and to redirect blood away from those atelectatic regions. Overall, recruitment maneuvers aim to reopen those collapsed lung units. One way to think about it is that alveoli are somewhat similar to balloons. So if you've ever blown up a balloon, you, re you realize that at low volumes or collapsed volumes, the alveoli are really hard to open up, or the balloon it takes a lot of pressure and force to open up. But at some point, the balloon opens up and it becomes very easy to, ventil or to, to, to ventilate the balloon or to blow air and the, the rest of the way into the balloon. And so it blows up very easily below some point.
above that point is where we typically ventilate during normal tidal volumes. But if normal tidal volumes fall below that point, then we then our lungs lungs collapse, they become atelectatic, and it becomes very hard for us to reopen them. Uh, recruit maneuvers, therefore, are very similar to the actions we naturally take to inflate these balloons. We take long, deep, hard breath <sighs> until it finally opens up, and it's very easy to ventilate or to op or to blow up the balloon. So collapsed alveoli require the application of increased and a sustained airway pressure to open, or we might say recruit, for improved ventilation and oxygenation. Now, collapsed alveoli are recruited across a spectrum of airway pressures. Some alveoli may, may require just a single uh, centimeter or two above atmosphere. Some may require 10 to 20. Some may require 40 to 50. So there's a whole um, spectrum of uh, uh, of pressures that are required to reopen these alveoli. And alveoli can therefore be recruited by either one of two methods. The first is frequently called CPAP method, and the second is frequently called the pressure control method. And the real benefit or the real way to think about recruitment maneuvers is, like many things, it's a balance between the benefits of alveolar recruitment, such as improved oxygenation, decreased ventilator-induced lung injury, and the, the, the negative consequences of over-distending the normal alveoli, such as increased risk of ventilator-induced lung injury, decreased cardiac output, decreased oxygen delivery. And this response to any recruitment maneuver is going to be based on that balance. Some lung units are going to have a lot of benefit. Some lung units are going to have a lot of risk. And so finding that balance is going to be what impacts the long-term patient's outcome. Now we're going to switch gears on to mechanical ventilation. First, we'll talk about non-invasive ventilation. And it's typically indicated for patients with respiratory failure due to either cardiogenic pulmonary edema, a COPD exacerbation. And there's data that suggests that the post-operative patient after thoracic surgery or abdominal surgery may have significant benefit from non-invasive ventilation. And in patients with uh, immunosuppression, there's also been shown a significant benefit for non-invasive mechanical ventilation. The flip side to that is patients with the in a, an inability to control their airway from neurologic status injury or for drugs or for, for any other reason, and then patients who have a prolonged irreversible type of respiratory failure, which is typically defined as greater than three hours. These types of patients probably should not be put on non-invasive ventilation. There are two types of non-invasive ventilation. The first is CPAP, and I've already sort of talked about it in two different, or in two different areas. But CPAP is designed primarily to treat hypoxemic respiratory failure. And in CPAP, the airway pressure is kept positive throughout the respiratory cycle. During inspiration, you have a slightly, uh, you have a, you, you maintain a positive airway pressure, and during exhalation, you keep a positive airway pressure. And this expiratory pressure improves oxygenation, similar to PEEP, as well as the inspiratory pressure, because it stays above zero. The mean airway pressure always stays above zero as well. BiPAP is designed to treat both hypercarbic and mixed forms of respiratory failure. Admittedly, BiPAP can also treat hypoxemia, but only because of its effects on uh, the expiratory pressure. The inspiratory pressure portions of BiPAP augments ventilation. The expiratory pressure improves oxygenation. So if you need more ventilation if a patient is hypercarbic, you're going to make significant changes to the inspiratory pressure. If you need more improvements in oxygenation, you're going to make changes to the expiratory pressure. And so there's three major settings for most BiPAP. There's the FiO2, there's the IPAP, or the inspiratory pressure, and then there's EPAP, or the expiratory pressure. And remember, the IPAP provides inspiratory support to the patient's own or the patient-generated tidal volume. In some ways, this may be similar to pressure support settings that you've seen. EPAP is somewhat physiologically similar to PEEP, and it improves oxygenation.
Now we're going to switch gears one last time to, to invasive mechanical ventilation. Now, invasive ventilation is indicated for respiratory failure when non-invasive ventilation has failed or is inappropriate due to underlying patient or environmental factors. There are no significant contraindications, although you may want to consider whether to use invasive ventilation or not in or to use it cautiously in several different patient uh, scenarios. Because invasive ventilation is sort of a double-edged sword. It can both improve oxygenation and ventilation, but it can also simultaneously worsen respiratory system dysfunction. The complications of invasive mechanical ventilation include ventilator-induced lung injury, and the four major types of ventilator-induced lung injury are volutrauma, barotrauma, atelect trauma, and biotrauma. can also cause ventilator-associated pneumonia, something called ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, where over time, mechanical ventilation causes your diaphragm to, to become dysfunctional and you become ventilator-dependent for prolonged periods. And then finally, ventilator-induced systemic weakness, where your arms and leg muscles become weaker and weaker and weaker over time. So there's four major complications, and these are very significant, um, particularly with the use of invasive mechanical ventilation. The most important concept to think about in terms of invasive ventilation is whether to use volume control modes of ventilation or pressure control modes of ventilation. In volume control, the major goal is to ensure that the delivered minute ventilation is maintained at the specified target level. So the specific tidal volume is set by the operator, by you. And that set tidal volume is delivered with every breath regardless of the pressure that's generated because of that breath. Now, a caveat is that the ventilator may have an operator-defined pressure limit, but that's somewhat different. All it does is set off an alarm that's different than actually changing the amount of tidal volume that's delivered because of a pressure. The overall major benefit of volume control is that it provides a constant minute ventilation. Here's a, um, a pressure time waveform and a flow time waveform. In the top graph, there's a graph of the pressure on the y-axis and time in the x-axis. In this, you can see that with each breath, there's a, first a small negative deflection. That's the patient generating or, or generating a breath. And from there, the pressure slowly but surely goes up until exhalation starts. Again, throughout a volume control, the pressure will gradually go up and up and up as the lungs are filled with increasing tidal volume or increasing percentage of the total tidal volume. The flow time waveform is the bottom waveform. Notice that the flow is stable. There is a constant flow. It doesn't increase. It doesn't decrease. The flow is constant throughout inspiration. In pressure control, the major ventilator goal is to ensure that the inspiratory airway pressure is maintained at the specified or to the target level. So that specific airway pressure is set by the operator. That airway pressure is the same as the peak pressure is the same as the plateau pressure. Tidal volume and flow rate will vary from breath to breath as the respiratory system compliance and resistance changes. And the major benefit to pressure control is that there is a reduced risk of barotrauma. In pressure control, inspiratory flow decelerates or decreases throughout inspiration because once that target pressure is met, inspiratory flow must continuously decrease to avoid exceeding that target pressure. As the lung fills, you need less and less flow to maintain that same um, set pressure. The rate of the, of the descent is dependent on the patient's inspiratory demand and the patient's respiratory system mechanics, such as the compliance and the resistance. Here is a pressure time and flow time waveform for pressure control. In the top, notice that the pressure is, starts at PEEP and then it increases very rapidly to a set amount of inspiratory pressure that is stable, not only throughout inspiration, but is stable from breath to breath 
to breath. Each breath is at the same level of pressure. And then when the breath ends when inspiration ends it goes immediately back down to peep the bottom uh, waveform is the flow time waveform notice that it goes from zero flow to maximum flow very quickly at the same time that the the top pressure goes from peep to maximum pressure these all occur at the same time and you go from zero to maximum flow very rapidly and then throughout inspiration um, the flow decreases throughout inspiration and then you cycle over to exhalation. The major difference this table summarizes the major difference between volume targeted and pressure targeted. Uh, with regard to the peak airway pressure in volume targeted, it's going to be variable. Uh, as you get as the, you're being delivered the same tidal volume breath to breath to breath, if your compliance increases or your resistance increases, your peak airway pressure will rise. How, whereas in pressure targeted modes of ventilation or pressure control modes of ventilation, their air, peak airway pressure will be constant regardless of changes in your compliance or resistance. The flip side to that is the tidal volume. In volume targeted, the tidal volume is going to be constant from breath to breath to breath to breath. But in pressure targeted, that's going to change from breath to breath depending on the respiratory system compliance and resistance. With regard to peak flow in volume targeted, it's constant, breath to breath to breath. And with regard to pressure targeted, it's going to be variable. The flow pattern in volume targeted is going to be constant or stable. And in pressure, and in pressure targeted, it's going to be decelerating. Now a quick review of some of the basic modes of ventilation. The first is controlled mandatory ventilation. In controlled mandatory ventilation, the ventilator does not interact with the patient. It has no sensing capability. It delivers what it delivers. The inspiratory trigger is only based on the respiratory rate set by the ventilator operator, set by you. There is a significant risk of patient ventilator asynchrony, and there is also a significant risk of ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction, when this mode of ventilation is used for a prolonged period in the ICU. In fact, for these reasons, it's really a historical mode that's only used in the OR. And admittedly, it's even, it's even infrequently used in the OR. Assist control ventilation is much more frequently used in the ICU and is increasingly used in the OR as well. With assist control ventilation, the ventilator is triggered by patient effort Although there is a set rate that serves as a backup respiratory rate if the patient's effort falls below the set rate. Similar breaths are delivered breath by breath to breath, breath to breath to breath, independent of the trigger, whether it's machine triggered or patient triggered. There, compared to controlled mandatory ventilation, there is a reduced risk of patient ventilator asynchrony and there's also a reduced risk of ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction. Synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation was designed as a, as a ventilator mode that makes it easy to wean patients from full support to minimal support. Um, it provides a set number of mandatory breaths that can be altered by you, the operator. The delivered breaths, those set mandatory delivered breaths are synchronized to patient effort. Between those mandatory breaths, however, the ventilator allows for spontaneous breathing by the patient. Those spontaneous breaths can be augmented with pressure support so that the work of breathing of those spontaneous breaths is not dramatically uh, increased. Finally, in terms of pressure support ventilation, there is no set rate. If a patient becomes apneic in America, American ventilators are required to have a backup mode. So there is no set rate, all breaths are triggered by the patient, and if the patient becomes apneic, the ventilator will, um, be, will uh, convert to a backup mode that allows some breaths to be determined, or to, some breaths to be, given, to be given to prevent complications to the patient. The breaths are terminated based on flow reaching a threshold value. So remember, pressure support is a pressure control mode of ventilation such that the flow decelerates from maximum or peak airway flow down to minimum. So once the, the, 
the flow reaches some threshold value, which is typically a set percentage of the maximum flow, then the breath is terminated and exhalation begins. The inspiratory pressure is set to augment the tidal volume during inspiration, so it's it, the, the, the inspiratory pressure serves to increase the tidal volume or, said another way, to reduce the work of breathing through the endotracheal tube. It's used to facilitate spontaneous breathing trials, and there is a very low risk of patient ventilator asynchrony and a very low risk of ventilator-induced diaphragmatic dysfunction. Finally, we're going to talk about a couple of advanced modes of ventilation. Airway pressure released ventilation, or APRV, is a ventilation mode designed to maintain a prolonged inspiratory phase at an elevated pressure. This allows for a very high mean airway pressure at a relatively low maximum inspiratory pressure. This mean airway pressure improves oxygenation similar to very high levels of PEEP. It, it improves shunt and, and improves recruitment. Spontaneous ventilation is also permitted during the inspiratory phase and it too further improves shunt in um, collapsed lung. Intermittent pressure releases are designed to facilitate CO2 exchange so that you don't have hypercarbia with the release of APRV. In high-frequency oscillation, the ventilation is provided at a very rapid rate, and the tidal volume is lo very low, typically less than anatomic dead space. This very high rate ventilation, or sorry, at, at a low tidal volume, allows you to maintain a relatively stable or constant mean airway pressure, which can be titrated up with relative ease. And gas exchange during high-frequency oscillation occurs through a number of complex and somewhat poorly understood mechanisms. And overall, it requires a multidisciplinary team that understands the complexity of respiratory care, particularly as it relates to high-frequency oscillatory ventilation. So conclusions, respiratory failure is defined by three types, hypoxemia, hypercarbia, and a mixed hypoxemic hypercarbic form. The symptoms of respiratory failure lead to severe widespread multi-organ dysfunction and cardiac arrest, if not quickly reversed, and the treatment is always aimed to improve the underlying disease processes. Hypoxemia can be supported with different therapies, including increased FiO2, including nasal cannula or face mask, non-invasive ventilation, including CPAP, and invasive ventilation with PEEP and recruitment maneuvers. In addition, hypercarbia can be supported with different therapies as well, including non-invasive ventilation, particularly BiPAP, and invasive ventilation with a variety of basic and advanced modes of ventilation. Thank you so much. I appreciate your willingness to listen. My name again is Kevin Hatton, and my contact information is on the screen below. Please feel free to contact me via email with any questions you might have, and thank you very much.